A warm welcome to our viewers here in Nigeria and around the world. You're watching the world today. I'm Amarachi Ubani in Lagos. Here are the headlines. Vietnamese billionaire is sentenced to death for a $12.5 billion court case. Those are your headlines. The World Today starts now. A welcome one and all. We begin with developing news this hour. Former NFL great, one of the most infamous high-profile Americans of all time, O.J. Simpson, has died after a battle with cancer. The 76-year-old became really popular in the 90s when he stood trial for the double murder of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman, only to be acquitted. A post on his social media handle on X reads, On April 10th, our father, Orenthal James Simpson, succumbed to his battle with cancer. He was surrounded by his children and grandchildren. During this time of transition, his family asked that you please respect their wishes for privacy and grace. It is signed, The Simpson Family. The late O.J. Simpson had been battling prostate cancer in recent years, and his health took a turn for the worse of late, with him landing in hospice care within the past few months. Our Washington correspondent Maria Bird is on the story for us. Maria, this is shocking news, especially as it seemed O.J. Simpson would live a long and healthy life after his acquittal in the 90s. Yes, you are exactly correct. This is shocking news for Americans. Even though he's been in hospice for quite some time, it has definitely been something the family has not necessarily made public. Um, so I think many people did not even realize how sick he actually was um, because as we know, prostate cancer is deadly. Um, but it's one of those that a lot of times people recover from. Um, and 76, even though might seem older um, in America, that is not necessarily an age in which people um, are, are dying at rapid rates. And so I think this is um, very much a surprise. Um, and those in the community uh, where he's lived, especially Los Angeles, are just definitely um, impacted uh, by this news. Now, according to TMZ, the entertainment uh, uh, channel in the U.S., he was looking frail in the lead up to his pa passing, though they have a picture of him where he's walking with a cane in hand and even reported him being in hospice care, but nothing was said about his cancer. No, you're exactly correct. There are um, images of that, and as you said, TMZ um, has been able to secure some of those. Um, but I think, as you said, that there was not much information, um, and many people are saying this was a true mystery, um, the fact that he was touched on a cancer diagnosis in 2023, and as you said, it was posted there, um, and some of the frailty that you see here in January of 24, um, that uh, obviously was the beginning of what uh, many are considering his hospice time frame. Many iconic people uh, in, you know, the U.S., especially remember the O.J. Simpson trials that really dominated in many news media, even around the world, he was an American sports great. Could you tell us a bit more about his time before that trial? Yes. Uh, you know, if you think about what many have considered the mecca, the, uh, you know, uh, the highlight, uh, one of the um, trailblazers in American football, um, that would be the image most definitely one of the images would be Ole Simpson. Um, as you said, this is something that um, was before uh, many people can remember um, the uh, the average age of 34 year old might not remember OJ Simpson in that regard but um, OJ Simpson um, from a historical perspective uh, was a trailblazer uh, within American football and that is kind of what led him to um, kind of having this great legacy uh, throughout America but as you said obviously the trial that occurred um, in the 90s um, where we all know Johnny Cochran became a very famous uh, lawyer after after that, as a result of that acquittal, um, kind of became a different side of O.J. Simpson that obviously has taken on uh, much of his, uh, uh, much of the influence that he's had over the last few years has been related to that. And I know the news is trickling through um, many circles in the U.S. Just wondering what sports personalities have said about him and possibly some famous teammates. 
Yeah, so the sports personalities obviously are going to focus on, I mean, you know, this is a very sad day um, for many of I me, mean, for his family specifically, and many of those who were fans and who loved O.J. Simpson. So they're going to focus on the, the legacy that he left behind um, as a football great. Um, obviously, you can't help but to discuss, um, obviously, some of the more uh, challenges that existed with him over the last few years. Um, so that will be part of it. But they'll be focusing again on on the life that he lived and what led him uh, to the fame that he had, which was um, his talents on the football field. So that will be the focal point and obviously the, the friends um, and all of those who played with him um, and those who were mentored by him um, will be discussing his life um, on this day and for a few days to come. This hasn't been mentioned often. Was he inducted in any Hall of Fame and could he still be inducted posthumously? For sure. O.J. Simpson is known as one of the great uh, football uh, legends. And so um, even after someone has uh, passed on, uh, they can definitely um, be inducted into Hall of Fames. Um, after that, obviously, you know, um, O.J. Simpson has definitely uh, been recognized um, on many occasions um, as uh, a football great and a Hall of Famer for sure, but uh, we will probably see many more recognition of him um, in the Hall of Fame um, after um, his passing. Maria, thanks again for bringing us up to speed on this. Thank you. Happening in other parts of the world, at least 17 Pakistani pilgrims have died in a bus crash while traveling to a shrine in Balochistan for Eid al-Fitr celebrations. The accident occurred late on Wednesday when the vehicle lost control before falling into a ravine. More than 40 people are being treated in, for injuries in Karachi and police have warned casualties could rise. High fatality crashes are common in Pakistan, often caused by driver error and poorly maintained roads. Balochistan Chief Minister Sindh Murad Ali Shah told reporters two children were among the injured and at least five people had sustained serious head injuries. In France, the mayor of a small town in central eastern France has been detained after police said 70 kilograms of cannabis was found in a home. Police said it had also discovered about one kilogram of cocaine and 7,000 euros worth of cash and gold bars. The public prosecutor said Jamila Habsawi, the mayor of Avalon, and two of her brothers were among seven people arrested earlier this week. Ms. Habsawi's lawyer denied that she knew the drugs were stored in her home. The mayor's house, the town hall and the pharmacy where Ms. Habsawi worked were all searched. Mr. Philly says her arrest on Sunday was the result of several weeks of investigations into drug trafficking in the town, which is home to 6,000 people and located in the bourgogne franche comte region. A court in Vietnam has sentenced a billionaire to death over her role in a $12.5 billion financial fraud case. At the end of the trial, property developer Trong Mai Lan was found guilty of embezzlement, bribery and violations of banking rules. She denied all charges. She looted the country's largest bank, Saigon Joint Stock Commercial Bank, over a period of 11 years through thousands of ghost companies and by paying bribes to government officials. The 67-year-old's case is seen as one of the greatest bank frauds the world has ever seen, but her lawyers now have 15 days to appeal the verdict. She is one of very few women in Vietnam to be sentenced to death for a white-collar crime. The value of her alleged asset appropriation was equivalent to about 3% of Vietnam's gross domestic product in 2022. Prosecutors say they seized more than 1,000 properties belonging to her. WikiLeaks editor-in-chief Kristen Rafsonson has joined dozens of protesters demanding an end to the extradition of founder Julian Assange. The protesters gathered outside the Australian High Commission in London. Of course, the only solution that we want to see is the United States government dropping the case against Julian Assange. Seeing as a growing number of people do see this is a, a persecution, this is an attack on press freedom, this is an absolutely uh, uh, an outrageous practice. 
and a five years for innocent men to be sitting in prison is just more what any kind anybody should be enduring in the civilized world. The American government now has until uh, April 16 next week to deliver so-called assurances that they will uh, honor the rights of Julian Assange as a, as a journalist, so to speak, and have First uh, uh, Amendment rights in the United States, uh, just as a U.S. citizen would, and also that they will not impose the death penalty on Julian Assange. It is then up to the judges to decide whether they think that the assurances is, are, are uh, sufficient. If they do so, they will probably order the extradition of Julian. If not, there will be a debate on uh, on the merits of these uh, so-called assurances on uh, May 20th. I saw him uh, uh, about three weeks ago. Uh, I will visit him uh, tomorrow uh, when uh, we will pass this five-year mark. So tomorrow morning I will go to Belmar's prison. Of course he suffers and he has been uh, suffering as anybody would uh, after all these years, five years in this uh, hellhole is just uh, unimaginable for an intellectual, a non-violent intellectual that uh, is there among murderers and hardcore criminals. Check in with the weather now. This time in the U.S., Texas has been hit by severe weather with winds up to 90 miles per hour as a short track EF1 tornado ripped through commercial properties in the city of Cathy near the capital Houston. This is the early hours of Wednesday. The Harris County area of Texas was struck by thunderstorms which downed trees and power lines, bringing up to four inches of rainfall in places and reportedly leaving more than 170,000 residents without power. Collapsed buildings in a business center that consists of shops, an auto repair center, a sports bar and restaurants with debris were seen scattered around an adjoining car park. Employees were reported inside the Bourbon Street Sports Bar, damaged when the tornado struck, but were unharmed. One person was later treated for minor shock. Severe weather struck across the southeastern U.S. on Tuesday, with a second tornado touching down in Lake Charles in the neighboring state of Louisiana. Central and southern U.S. states of Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, Arkansas, North Dakota, Montana, Ohio, Colorado, and Wyoming are frequently hit by tornadoes, which have seen the territory termed Tornado Valley. More than 1,400 tornadoes touched down in the U.S. in last year alone, causing 83 deaths. In nearby Canada, the government says it is preparing for another explosive wildfire season for which it is training extra firefighters. A warmer than normal winter has left little snow on the ground and has compounded droughts in several regions. Last year was by far Canada's worst for wildfires, with 15 million hectares of forest burned. Linking the issue to climate change, a minister warned that this year could prove even more devastating. The Minister for Emergency Preparedness, Harjit Sajjan, said the summer was impossible to predict, but wildfires would continue to pose a significant challenge for the foreseeable future. And a major search and rescue operation is underway after an avalanche in the Austral Alps in Western Austria hit. Three people have been killed, four, a fourth person been taken to hospital. Police say 17 members of a Dutch ski group were in the area at the time, along with four local mountain guides. Four of the Dutch group were buried by the avalanche, which took place close to the Martin Bush hut at an altitude of 2,500 meters. Two of them had died before they could be rescued. The local head of emergency services says rescue teams, dock teams and the Alpine police had headed to the scene. He warned that the danger of new avalanche was very high, so rescue workers also needed to proceed with caution. Authorities in the Comoros say dozens of prisoners have escaped from a prison in the capital Moroni by simply walking through the main gate. The island's public prosecutor, Ali Mohamed Junaid, said 38 inmates were missing from Moroni prison, the largest in the archipelago. 
He blames negligent security guards. A government spokesperson says an escape appears to have been pre-planned and authorities have started an investigation into what happened. Coming closer to the continent now, the Mali military junta suspended all political activities in the country until further notice. According to spokesperson Colonel Ablai Maiga, what he calls sterile discussions uh, are ongoing. It's a national dialogue prompted by the suspension. In his statement via state television broadcast on Wednesday, he says the ban is to maintain public order. More than 80 political parties and several groups recently called for presidential elections to hold as soon as possible to put an end to military rule. Mali has been ruled by the junta since a 2022 coup. In Kenya, the Kenyan capital Nairobi, a public hospital has laid off 100 doctors who are taking part in a nationwide strike that's been ongoing for almost a month. The Kenyatta Hospital Referral, University Hospital Referral, has said new doctors have been hired in their place of the striking doctors. Doctors in Kenya went on a nationwide strike in mid-March demanding better pay and working conditions. President William Ruto on Sunday broke his silence over the strike, saying there was no money to pay the strike inductors, but the union has remained adamant. Hundreds of them took part in protests, presented a petition to Parliament on Tuesday, urging lawmakers to intervene in their labour dispute. But for doctors who are serving, your skills cannot be taken away. Yes! Yes! Your skills yes! cannot be taken away. Yes! You have your skills and you must protect it. Yes! You can only go to with these skills to the grave. Yes! And so we are saying that we are going to protect the profession with death, blood and tears. Yes! They should listen to us. We are not going to surrender. This is the beginning and we are going to be on the streets until our, our views are heard. What I really want to bring forth is that to talk about, uh, they talk about the wage bill. They talk about the wage bill. Kindly, like which I'm imploring you to cut across all the public servants in Kenya. It's not only doctors or public, public servants. And it's unconstitutional according to our, to our labor laws. It's unconstitutional for, for minister to actually cut the, 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 the salaries of uh, in terms of or any employed person by the government by 90%. Rwanda is issuing a warning against promoting hatred and disunity to prevent a repeat of a genocide it suffered 30 years ago. During the 30th commemoration of the 1994 genocide, the High Commissioner to Nigeria, Mr. Christoph Bazivamo, conveyed this message in Abuja. The commemoration, themed Remember, Unite, Renew, over several years, marks a solemn beginning to Rwanda's 30th anniversary remembrance of the 1994 genocide. The tragic event was planned, was a planned massacre by Hutu extremists targeting the Tutsi minority lasting over a hundred days. The path to lasting peace demands constant vigilance. And as we renew, we restart our unbreakable pledge to fight intolerance, discrimination, ethnic hatred, hate speech, genocide, revisionism, and denial in all the forms. But unfortunately, this is happening today just beyond Rwanda's borders in the Great Lakes region. We should never allow the embers of hatred to reignite. This Kwibuka 30, together we can ensure that the memory of our victims becomes a powerful force for good, inspiring future generations to choose peace over hate, unity over division, and the hope over despair. Let us work together to build a world where such atrocities never happen again. Let us renew our commitment 
to the values of tolerance, compassion, human dignity in our, our transformative journey, continuously building a better future for all. Welcome back. Let's check in on the South African economy, where unemployment rate remains among the highest in the world. That's according to Statistics South Africa. In the first quarter of 2024, 21,000 jobs were lost. Meanwhile, entrepreneurs in Johannesburg believe the township economy has the potential to reduce the country's high unemployment rate. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Zimosa, explains. Well, it's often said that entrepreneurship is vitally important for every economy, but they often face many challenges, be it crippling economy, weak currency, and lack of funding. 39-year-old Msizi Gombe has been running a mobile kitchen for the past five years. He firmly believes in the potential of the township economy to alleviate the country's high unemployment rate. Certainly it does. Um, it's only that uh, most uh, entrepreneurs in the township have uh, valued themselves and um, thought of themselves being small and medium enterprises. But nobody wants to be small. As small as I am today, I don't wish to continue to be small. So we can create employment, we can create opportunities for um, joint ventures, partnerships. With half of South Africa's population living in the estimated 532 townships around the country, businesswoman Lesejo Sanelo says vast potential lies in the so-called township economy. Let's come together, but understanding that the solutions reside with us, within us, and we ourselves are the Indunas, are the Lokotlas, you know, because that's what it is. Um, and often we think because it's this eloquent English it actually isn't what happens within our communities, whereas in fact, the systems mirror each other. The only difference is that the one is regulated and the other is self-regulated. Why don't we um, industrialize our very own communities? Who says it's not possible? You know, the capital resides within our own communities. So it's about shifting the paradigm in saying it's not as bad as we think because actually, the solutions reside within us as a people. According to Lesejo, South Africa's efforts to develop townships face many challenges. The gap resides in implementation. We're very good at formulating policies that are among the world's renowned. We're not so good at executing. Entrepreneur Lerato Sanelo encourages fellow entrepreneurs to persist and persevere. So anyone in the township, the start for me, is believe in your business, believe in yourself. And once that, that is the foundation, everything else can sort of start to fall into place. And another thing that I realized, once that happens, you start to draw the right people. Um, and we need to stop looking at the solutions from the people that are way up there, you know. In a country with an unemployment rate of over 32%, some believe that the informal sector is a lifeline to countless families who lack formal employment. Meanwhile, Mzizi's aspiration to franchise his business continues. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channels Television News. Eid celebrations all over the world have been really interesting even here in Nigeria. And that's why hundreds of horse riders galloped to Zaria's Durba Festival in the north as Muslims continue the celebrations. Take a look. Hundreds of revelers riding horses, playing musical instruments and wearing colorful traditional clothing at this year's Durba festival in Zaria. Locals are celebrating the end of the holy month of Ramadan. If there is no horse riding, so people will be so... People will not be happy because every people they are coming from every village and everywhere to gather to see their emir in a colored dress and other horse rider. For tourists like Barbara Patricia, it's always a fantastic time. It's always a very fantastic time for me to engage with the local people, to, you know, be part of their culture and um, just enjoy the festivity. 
the traditions, but it's just so fantastic. It's it's not to be missed. Jibril explains that the festival represents the number of horses and warriors that were present before the country's colonization, showing the allegiance and strength of the kingdom. Yes, it shows a strength. It shows that the kingdom have a warriors. The kingdom have a, a, a number of horses and a number of warriors. Before that, uh, before the colonization, you know how the, the kingdoms are. One will be fighting another kingdom so that you have a large kingdom. So it's still uh, because after the colonization, there is no any going out to fight. But still, we come out to show our allegiance and to show the strength of the uh, kingdom. The Durban Festival, an annual religious and equestrian celebration, comes on Eid al Fitri at the end of the month long dawn to sunset fasting of Ramadan. It falls on the first day of the 10th month of Shawal in the Islamic lunar calendar, commencing with the rising of the crescent moon. Now it's not the start of another year in Abu Dhabi. It is the end of the Ramadan and the Eid al-Fitr celebrations in the United Arab Emirates. Hundreds of locals and tourists, as you see, they're gathered at the capital Abu Dhabi to enjoy the vibrant fireworks display marking the end of the fasting period and the celebrations. It was a surreal moment as, sky as the skyline lit up with a huge number of fireworks display. People also enjoy the soothing view of the waterfront. Celebrate the end of the Ramadan. Workers in both public and private sectors have given official have been given official five day holidays. In the run up to the holiday, residents were seen buying gifts and treats to celebrate, with local markets seeing large crowds. Eid al Fitr comes at the end of the holy month of Ramadan. It's one of the main religious holidays of Islam, marked on April 10th to 12th in the UAE this year. Enjoy. I assume there was a lot of shopping with lots of discounts uh, for people to enjoy and mark the end of the Ramadan season. Thanks for watching the world today. I'm Amarachi Ubadi.